I want to start out by, again, thanking and congratulating Pat Hines for working with her team to put together this amazing gathering. I've been coming for a number of years, and it's really a special place to come together and, and trade ideas. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you today about how spaceports can enable the space economy. But before I do that, I wanted to ask you a question. How many of you have seen the movie Ad Astra? Not too many, okay. I had a chance to watch it a couple weeks ago, and it's good, so I highly recommend it. I'm not gonna spoil the plot for you, but one of the things that I found most intriguing in the film was even though it apparently takes place just a short time in the future, the amount of space activity throughout the solar system is just incredible. There's a very sophisticated moon base. There's a scientific station on Mars. There are human expeditions to the outer planets. And the commercial sector is also quite active. There are regularly scheduled flights from Earth to the lunar surface. And at that moon base, in addition to a launch pad and a control room, there's also an Applebee's restaurant and a Starbucks. So <laughs> I'm not sure how long it's going to be before we see that level of activity. But as I think this group knows, the amount of commercial space-related activity right now is pretty impressive. We've heard some numbers earlier in the week about Space Foundation and their reports. Another group that does a good job at that is uh, Bryce Space and Technologies, and they put out a report in 2018 looking at the global space economy, and their assessment was in 2018, the figure was about $360 billion. Pretty good figure there, and the brown segment of that graph and the upper left quadrant, that is from government budgets. So the percentage of government spending to make up that economy is less than 25%. So that's pretty amazing when you think about it. And the neat thing is if you talk to the people who know about economics and finances and all the rest, the experts in those fields, they're telling folks, that this is really going to continue to grow in the next few years. So UBS, which is a Swiss-based international space finance firm, is estimating that in 10 years that global space economy could reach $805 billion. In 20 years, it could be a trillion dollars. Morgan Stanley says by 2040, we should expect it to reach $1.1 trillion. And the Bank of America Merrill Lynch is estimating that by 2045, that figure could be $2.7 trillion. So tremendous growth in the global space economy. And in my opinion, much of that economic growth could take place at or nearby spaceports, which is pretty exciting. Now, there are some skeptics, including some very senior government officials, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, has been quoted as saying that we may have too many spaceports. Well, with all due respect to Secretary Ross, I strongly disagree with that assessment. Let me tell you why. Before we talk about how many spaceports we need, let's provide a little bit of context and, and maybe ask a question, well, how many airports do we need? I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I can tell you how many we have. And the Bureau of Transportation Statistics estimates that in 2017, which is the last year that they have complete data on, in the United States, there were 19,655 airports. And worldwide, we're talking about 41,788 airports. Now compare that with a handful of operational spaceports. And of course, not all spaceports are alike. In fact, either starting from a rocket and looking where to fly it, or starting from a location and deciding what the rocket should look like, 
we see that we have launched vehicles of all different kinds, different sizes, different operational configurations, vertical takeoff, horizontal takeoff, air launch, ground launch, purely rocket powered or combination rocket powered and turbine powered. And these are flying different kinds of missions for different kinds of customers. Some are suborbital, some are orbital. And they use a variety of different trajectories and altitudes and inclinations. So that leads to a related issue, and that is that our current spaceport infrastructure is very limited, and it's rather fragile and vulnerable. Most US launches today take place either from Cape Canaveral in Florida, from Wallops Island on the Eastern Shore in Virginia, or from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And if you look at those locations, there's somewhat of a history of various natural disasters that have had some experience in those areas, such as hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and wildfires. Over the last many years, we've had some launch pad accidents. And in today's world, we shouldn't completely dismiss the possibility of a terrorist attack. If one of those events were to take place and significantly damage or completely destroy one of our launch pads or facilities, the particular kind of launch vehicle which is based at that site may lose its access to space. And that could be something that lasts for many months or even years as the repairs are made. So as we think about how many spaceports we have and how many we need, I think it's helpful to look at what do we do at spaceports anyway. And I would like to propose that we really need to think about that in a different way. Instead of just viewing spaceports as locations from which launches and reentries are conducted, I think it's important also to recognize that they can serve as focal points and technology hubs to support things like aerospace manufacturing, research and technology efforts, education and training, workforce development, and point-to-point -point transportation. Certainly, we're going to continue to want to launch satellites. And that'll be true for many, many years to come. Although it would be helpful to have some choices and some options and maybe a little more resiliency in where we can do those things. Within the next 12 months, we expect to see two companies starting their commercial suborbital space tourism operations. And there are many places all over the world that would love to be a base of operations for one of those activities, for its citizens, and to see the particular geography and terrains and the beauty of that part of the world. But there's also other things that can be done at or near spaceports, things like manufacturing. Blue Origin and OneWeb have both recently built very modern and extensive factories for their future manufacturing use. But we can talk about not just rockets, but also modules and landers and satellites, systems, subsystems, components, or places where you can do final assembly and integration. All that makes a lot of sense if it's nearby to a spaceport. There's lots of research and technology going on, and that will continue to be true in the future, whether that's for vehicles or satellites, rocket engines, parachutes, avionics, software, lots of different disciplines. I believe there's an important opportunity to do some education and training in conjunction with spaceports, whether it's a regular classroom or things like centrifuges, altitude chambers, places to do parabolic aircraft flights, or opportunities to gain experience or learn about operating in a spacesuit. If we're going to continue to grow the global space economy, we're going to need a workforce. They, we're going to want them to be educated and motivated and experienced. And how are we going to get that? Well, one way would be to start now 
and build those relationships between places like spaceports and local high schools and community colleges, universities, can conduct classes there, expose people to real hardware, have academic projects, training programs, internships, co-ops, apprenticeships. Those are things that can be real win-win relationships. I believe point-to-point -point transportation is definitely in our future. And it's going to make sense to have a location where you start and you complete those flights. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. But if we can gain agreement on this broader understanding of what a spaceport is and can be, I think it could really be helpful if we can articulate and document and then communicate this wider vision in a new policy. And there's a, a number of different ways that we could do that. One way might be through an executive order that comes out of the White House. Congress could pass a resolution with its thoughts. Perhaps this is something that could be developed and debated in the National Space Council and end up being signed out by the president as a space policy directive. So what would this policy look like? My thoughts would be something like this. The US government strongly supports the development and operation of commercial spaceports in order to ensure national security, maintain technological leadership, enable international competitiveness, and provide inspiration for students and the development of a robust aerospace workforce. Relatively simple, but if we can get agreement on that as a principle, as a policy, I think it could really clarify how we decide on things like priorities and spending and cooperation compared to where we are today. Now having a policy is one thing, but the best metric of whether it's going to be successful is in the implementation, right? So today I'd like to share with you four recommendations that I would like to offer in terms of how we can specifically use spaceports to grow the space economy. And they include the following. Increasing federal funding and incentives for space-related infrastructure. Expand the definition of space support vehicles. Implement a spaceflight training education program and establish a point-to-point -point space transportation initiative. So we'll briefly go through each of those. There's a long history in this country of support for transportation infrastructure, whether we're talking highways or railroads, seaports or airports. And yet, even though we incredibly rely on space, not only for things like national security, but for our everyday life. There are no programs right now to support the infrastructure we need for space-related activities. It's almost unbelievable. There's at least two broad categories of ways that I think the federal government could help. It could provide direct support in terms of funding, or it could provide indirect support to encourage others to invest in that infrastructure. So in terms of direct support, we could modify the airport improvement program. Every year, the FAA gives out more than $3 billion, with a B, for the airport improvement program. And that's been fantastic in terms of allowing us to have the safe and efficient aviation system that we have in this country today. But there's nothing comparable for spaceports. Congress did pass something it called the Space Transportation Infrastructure Matching Grant Program back in the 1990s, but it never appropriated any funding for that. So that would be another alternative. The Department of Transportation has special grant programs such as the BUILD grants. This year, they put aside $900 million for that, for roads and ports and bridges. Why isn't some of that money going to space-related activities? I think it should. If for whatever reason the federal government says, nope, there's no money in it, at least the government could facilitate, encourage 
others to invest in infrastructure for this type of thing. And that could include things like bonds and loans, guarantees, tax incentives, prizes, competitions, demonstrations, or structuring program requirements like DARPA did with the DARPA launch challenge that would require people to use different spaceports in order to win the prize. Next recommendation has to do with space support vehicles. It's been more than eight years now since the shuttle had its last system and, and flew. And yet NASA still trains its astronauts in a fleet of aircraft that they keep in Houston. Why? Because strapping into a cramped cockpit with a flight suit and a helmet and an oxygen mask, a parachute and G-suits, and being pushed back in your seat at unusual attitudes, talking concisely and crisply on the radio, and maintaining an up-to-date situational awareness is a fantastic way to keep trained and prepared for your eventual space flight, even if you're not going on a winged vehicle. So that's why they do it. Now, there are lots of people and companies who own high-performance aircraft, whether it's L-39s or F-104s, and they can take off and go fly around, fly get somewhere for lunch. What they're not allowed to do under the law is have somebody buy a ticket from them in the back seat because those are not certified aircraft. Now, Congress did talk about space support vehicles in the 2018 FAA reauthorization, but the definition that they included there does not include high-performance aircraft. They limited it to launch vehicles or elements thereof. I would like to see that definition expanded and allow operation of those systems under Title 51, so it would put it under the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and that could be handled with informed consent, just like commercial human space flights are today. And just like that, without costing any money from the taxpayers, you could enable a new part of our industry to give people the experience of what spaceflight is going to be like, to provide jobs, and to improve safety by better preparing those people for their eventual ride on the rockets. Next recommendation has to do with having a better relationship between aerospace and our educational institutions. Back in the 1980s, NASA had a great program. They were going to fly a teacher on the shuttle up to orbit and conduct a classroom lesson to schools all around the country, and they had everyone's attention. Unfortunately, that initiative ended in tragedy with the Challenger accident, but that was 33 years ago. I think it's time for another try, but with a slight twist, especially now, given that we've got companies about ready to start their suborbital space flights for space tourism. Instead of sending one teacher all the way to orbit, Let's send hundreds of teachers on suborbital flights. Now, I think you could probably get a, a quantity discount, but even if the cost ends up being $250,000 a seat, you could send some teacher from every state every year for about $12.5 million. And think of what that would do if they had that opportunity and then go back to their classrooms and motivate and excite their students with the stories that they have to tell and just light the fire in our kids today of how exciting space and aerospace could be. The final recommendation has to do with point-to-point -point transportation. I think the ability to conduct high-speed, long-distance transportation, specifically point-to-point -point transportation through space, is going to be a major game changer, both for national security and for economic competitiveness. This is an area that the U.S. has to lead. So we could have a government program, we could have NASA do something, or the military, or if we don't want to do that, let's at least work together collaboratively. Academia, government, industry, talk about prizes, contests, technology demonstrations, and work together, and I'll bet we can make some real progress in this area if we pay attention to it. So what would that look like? I don't know. If you haven't heard, Strato Launch, I guess, is still alive. They're hiring again. A few years ago, they talked about having a dream chaser type system that would be launched from that. Maybe you could use that for some initial point-to-point -point systems. 
Richard Branson has been talking about point-to-point -point for many years, and we just heard that they are now partnering with Boeing to look at systems. Would it be something like this? Don't know. Blue Origin, I don't think, has talked about point-to-point, -point, but maybe it would be possible to have a derivative of a New Shepard or maybe an upgraded system that would have some cross-range type capability. And we have seen the SpaceX Starship. Of course, that's intended to start colonies on Mars and to send things to the moon. But that type of a vehicle would have significant capability for point-to-point -point transportation from different points on the Earth. Or there may be other companies that we've never even heard of that can do this. And the nice thing is, you don't have to start with the final solution. Yes, we want a system to go from one side of the Earth to the other in 30 minutes or an hour. But we can take baby steps. There's lots of spaceports that we have here in the US. And if you look at a few of the combinations, maybe Blue Origin could start out by flying from Van Horn to Spaceport America. That's only 126 nautical miles. Maybe Virgin Galactic could figure out how to fly from Spaceport America to Mojave. That's only 592 miles. Maybe SpaceX could figure out how to take a Starship prototype from Boca Chica to Cape Canaveral. That's 914 miles. Let's take some baby steps and get some experience figuring out how to do this, and we might be surprised at how much progress we could make. So circling back, how many space towards do we need? I think we need as many as it takes to ensure our national security, to maintain technological leadership, enable international competitiveness, and provide inspiration for students and the development of our aerospace workforce. If any of these things resonate with you, if you would like to continue this conversation, I would strongly encourage you to consider attending the fifth Commercial Spaceport Summit. It's going to be Next month, November 19th, one day prior to the big Spacecom gathering, the George R. Brown Convention Center in Houston, sponsored by the Global Spaceport Alliance. Last year, we had about 50 people show up with representatives from 19 different current or proposed spaceports from all around the world and had some great conversations about challenges, opportunities, and how we can work together to grow this space economy. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much, George. Uh, so how about that visionary idea? What do you think? He's, he is a visionary. And I'm grateful for these questions here. Now, I believe we have some folks that would like to know your idea for uh, having a spaceport be a conference center. And I'm going to couple it with another uh, question here about having um, a holiday inn at a spaceport. So when we were establishing Spaceport America, we had an exclusion zone. So as the industry has evolved from those days to today, Taking into account that we would have a conference center where people would come in during a conference like this, that would preclude launch operations uh, likely from the spaceport during the conference time. What are your thoughts on that? So there's no one right answer. Again, think about all the different kinds of spaceports that we have. And there's a spaceport in Houston. How is that possible? Well, you just don't plan on launching space shuttles from downtown, that's all. And similarly, if it's not for experimental vehicles, yes, there's going to be a difference in terms of where the launch pad is and where the blockhouse is and where the launch control center is, but maybe a couple of three, five miles away, there's more commercial activity and, and restaurants and hotels and all the rest. I, I don't think it's out of the question. But the, the point is, we need to work together as a community and figure out how to get together, how to trade ideas. So, as we're talking about this, in the process right now, the NPRM comment period on the rulemaking, there is a discussion about very prescriptive uh, recommendations to have launch abort 
systems much more prescriptive than I think the spaceports would like and the spaceport uh, and the operators at spaceports. But taking into consideration that we're talking about them being in population centers like Houston or Denver, and I remember when we were putting Spaceport America together, the people at Wismer were very concerned that the call-up zones and the exclusion zones were not big enough, depending on what kind of operations we were having out of there. So where is the sweet spot for the regulatory environment to anticipate this real variety? So again, we, we don't have to make it a one-size-fits-all because things are different and different activities are going to make sense in different locations. Now, in terms of improving the, the regulations, I'm all for that. I think it's great. It needs to be a continuous process of improvement. But General Monteith and his office have one great advantage, and that is in the law, it provides the opportunity to waive any requirement on the books, basically, if as long as public safety is protected. And so even if we don't have quite the right words in all of the regulations right now, while we're working on that, we can use some common sense and waive different things or have equivalent levels of safety in order to make sure that we're continuing to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry while we protect public safety. Is Holiday Inn like there's some business development people from Holiday Inn in here, or what is going on with all this Holiday Inn questions? But really, people are, are, are asking a lot about this. So we're, we're, we've asked and answered on that one. What, um, what, what it, okay, we already know the, okay. How adequate is the current regulatory framework to support point-to-point -point suborbital flights? I think the basic framework is there. You're going to have to look at where can things go wrong and what population centers or other high-value assets could be affected by that and what kinds of mitigation steps do you need to take to ensure that you can turn off the engine or turn back around and land somewhere else or in other ways um, ensure public safety by conducting your operation. So again, we've, we've had contests and competitions to fly across the English Channel, to fly across the Atlantic, to have air races across the country and do all kinds of things. And yes, occasionally a plane will crash. We want to do everything we can to prevent those kinds of things from happening but I don't think we have to wait until everything's perfect before we do anything. Well, we'd all s still be sitting around uh, wondering what an airport is if we were waiting for that. So um, the, there's a question here, and it's a popular question, and there are people in this room who operate airports, spaceport, complexes. Uh, Dave Rupel from Denver and Arturo Machuco from uh, Ellington Field, now Houston Airport Systems. I don't think Cecil Field is here, for example. But what would it take? It's not a conversion, but I'm asking the question as it is here. What would it take to convert an airport into a spaceport? So again, right now, as many of you know, we have rules about what you have to do to be an airport, and you have rules about what you have to do to be a spaceport, and we have several places that do both, and that's fine. Both the examples you mentioned, there were some struggles and debates about, should we allow that, or can we do both at the same time? That's why I think it's important to have a national policy that says, yes, spaceports are important, go figure it out. And keep talking. Keep talking. Because people, when we were first working on Spaceport America, uh, and we would have every Saturday at PSL at NMSU, go to UNM um, once a quarter and go around the states, and ranchers would ask me, you all going to be building that spaceport to count my cattle? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Is the spaceport in the sky? 
What's that going? No, you know, we have to keep talking. You, if you're into this business, you are going, I'm always amazed what happens when we go out and talk to people about what it is we do, because Mary Lynn said it yesterday, even Congress, they don't, it's not in their daily lexicon. I don't think Boca Chica is designated as a spaceport. Is there a difference between a spaceport and a launch site? The regulations talk about launch sites and reentry sites. If you talk to a person on the street about a launch site, they don't know what you're talking about. So I love the term spaceport because it's similar to an airport or a seaport. So that's, that's not an official legal term, but I think it communicates better. Uh, the bottom line to your question is you don't really need to have a spaceport license if you're going to be launching from a location if the launch vehicle operator is the only one using that site. So all of the safety requirements that the FAA has can just be rolled into the launch license in that case. The spaceport license was sort of intended as, a, as something, well, we're going to hang on a shingle here and lots of people can launch. And, and the spaceport operator can manage all the different uses and requirements and uh, competition between the resources. And that, so Boca Chica yeah. doesn't need to have a license, neither does the Blue Origin site in West Texas. They're doing launches, but they're not selling those services to other operators, at least so far. So far. So the, I would ag agree that the, that is the answer to this question. Your thoughts about private citizens starting their own private spaceports instead of utilizing ones already licensed. Given your answer, as long as it's private citizen launching their vehicle from their spaceport. Yes, I, I think the more the merrier, and there's a way to, to handle all of the safety requirements specifically in the launch license itself. So recognize that there are lots of things to be looked at, including an environmental assessment and safety and impacts to historic sites and all that, but there are ways to do all those things. The, this question here about the role of the Office of Spaceports, I'm going to end with this question um, because there's really not much, um, I'm going to let you answer this one. What role could the Office of Spaceports at the FAA play in such a policy and this policy that I believe they're talking about is this idea of regulating point to point and I think that because there is no policy described in this thing but what role could the Office of Spaceports pl play in some of this discussion about the diversity of spaceports and spaceport operations let's say. I think it could be a, a great help. Congress just included in the 2018 FAA authorization bill the requirement for the FAA to create an office of spaceports with a director of spaceports. And so General Monteith is working on that now in his reorganization and he needs to get approval from FAA and DOT and everybody else. But if we can get that up and running with the appropriate resources in terms of staff and, and funding, then I think that office could be a huge benefit mm -hmm. in terms of being a focal point and an advocate for working some of these challenges that we've been talking about here today. We agree. Say hallelujah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neal.